Hi there. Welcome to Mushroom Hour. Today on Mushroom Hour, we're blessed by the presence of Adam Harriton, founder of Learn Your Land. Adam started the famous Learn Your Land platform in 2014 out of a desire to connect naturalists with people who wanted to learn from naturalists. Learn Your Land is now an advertisement-free media channel helping people to improve their nature skills one species at a time. Now, Adam spends most of his days either looking for mushrooms, plants, and trees, researching those mushrooms, plants, and trees, filming and editing videos and content all about those mushrooms, plants, and trees. Now, before his life became dedicated to this project, Adam actually studied classical piano and euphonium, toured as a drummer with a heavy metal band, all until his academic pursuits led him to study nutrition and dietetics at the University of Pittsburgh. I'm excited to learn from a naturalist who has taught me so much and who has dedicated so much time and effort to help us all learn more about the land under our feet. Adam, thank you so much for coming on the show. You're welcome. Thanks for having me, Darren. Well, this is an absolute pleasure. I've watched so many of your videos, followed you over the years, and I'm actually originally from the East Coast, so it was always fun to learn about East Coast biomes and habitats. So yeah, I'm just really stoked to have the chance to talk with you. And I'm curious, you know, now your life is totally dedicated to learn your land. What started all that in reading your bio information about playing music and studying nutrition, you know, being a heavy metal band member, <laughs> you know, when did this all kind of get you out into nature though, and, and focus on the natural world? It's not an easy question to answer. But I guess saying that doesn't provide a good answer for people listening to this podcast. So I have to kind of <laughs> I know it's a big question. It's a it's a life story, but maybe some of the little synchronicities or important events that, that led to that. Yeah. So 10, 11, 12 years ago, I wasn't the person I am today. And I know a lot of people might say the same thing. Yeah, we changed. We're not the same person we were 10 years ago, 20, 30 years ago. But I really wasn't. I mean, people who hung out with me 15 years ago would probably laugh at the person who I've become. But I'm totally proud of the person that I've become and I don't see myself doing anything else today. But I largely got here, I think, through adversity, particularly through health struggles. And it wasn't anything major, it wasn't anything serious, but you know, when I was 18, 19, 20 years old, I realized that the foods that I was eating, they weren't optimal for my body. And I don't know how I had the foresight to know that if I didn't start taking care of my body then, then 10 years from then, 20, 30, 40 years from then, the problems would just be compounded. And I don't know how I would end up. Now, I understand as we get older, things happen. You know, we age, we get bigger, or we get smaller, we lose muscle mass, things happen. Like, I know that's going to happen for sure. But I didn't think that at age 18, 19, 20, those kinds of things should have been happening to me. And I remember reading ingredient labels on, you know, wrappers of like granola bars, boxes of chips and crackers and being like, I can't believe I'm putting this stuff in my body. I can't even pronounce half these ingredients. And all my friends thought I was crazy. They literally thought I was crazy. But it was like a little clue into who I might become if I just followed that path. It was like a little sign. Just pay attention to this stuff. And it was just little bits here and there, just removing this from my diet, adding this to my diet, trying different things. And I just became obsessed with health and nutrition. It was just like a hobby of mine. Like the way I am about plants and mushrooms and trees today, just take that away and just talk about vitamin D and vitamin C and protein and carbs <laughs> and fats. Like I love talking about that stuff and geeking out about it. I loved it so much that I decided to go back to school for nutrition and dietetics. And I previously studied music and I was studying classical piano and euphonium and playing heavy metal on the side. So I went back to school for nutrition and I remember just looking out the window and just thinking, I want to be out there. I don't want to be inside. I want to be outside. Yeah. And fortunately, right around the same time, a lot of different fortuitous events were happening. You know, I met some people who literally lived down the road from me in the city of Pittsburgh who led foraging walks. And I couldn't believe, like, I met these people and they would take me on walks and they would show me what's edible and what's not edible and what they think is edible. And I remember taking plants to them and taking mushrooms to them. And so I owe a lot to them and the influence that they had on me. And it was just little bits here and there. I mean, one plant at a time piqued my interest. I would learn about nettles and the health benefits of nettles. So I'd start foraging nettles, bring them outside my home and plant them. I learned about medicinal mushrooms. And that's largely how I got into mushrooms was through medicinal mushrooms and just looking at different trees and thinking, is that chaga? 
Is that the Rishi mushroom? <laughs> it's not Chaga. It's not the Rishi mushroom. Until I did find Chaga and I found the other mushrooms as well. And I was just blown away that those things existed where I lived. I didn't have to order things online from China or from some other country. or I, I could find the things that I needed. They were all around me. And it just kept building and building and building to where now I love going outside, looking for plants, looking for mushrooms, looking for trees. And I realize now that the health benefit, of course, is through ingesting these things. But more so than that, it's the connection to the land that I live on. Like, that's the ultimate health benefit, I think. And I yeah. wouldn't be able to get there if I didn't eat these things, because it's the most intimate act to eat something. Like, you're putting something inside of your body and making yourself out of something. What could be more intimate than that? What could so be a more intimate That's kind of how I got here from heavy metal i guess the path from heavy metal out into nature but it's like a it's a theme of empowerment it's a theme about heightened conscientiousness and i think a lot of people's relationship with wild foods begins with that angle of nutrition or at least being fascinated by the idea that there are healthy foods that you can find just outdoors i think that's that's a pretty common vector for people to get into wild foods so you mentioned community and the folks that really helped you learn. I was curious about their early days for you, how you heightened your skills, how you sharpened your skills. You know, was this something that you found community and groups to be the most effective way to really start learning the land? Was it influential books or online resources? What was really the key to helping you become a better forager? Largely other people and mm. teachers and mentors. And I still strongly recommend that today. I realized I couldn't do it alone because I was so new to all this. I didn't grow up learning any of this stuff, knowing any of this stuff. I did not know the difference between an oak tree and a maple tree, even 12 years ago. Like right. you hold up the leaves. I guess I could put a guess as to which one is an oak tree or a maple tree, and I'd probably be right. But I couldn't tell you for sure. Now I can identify those things. But really hanging out with people who knew way more than I did. And kind of making, not intentionally making me feel uncomfortable, but putting myself in those uncomfortable situations where I didn't know anything and being willing to admit that I don't know anything. I have a lot of newbie questions, a lot of newbie questions, just about how nature works, like really simple stuff that you think a four-year-old would know and should know. <laughs> right. But like I said, those two people who lived down the street from me, they really helped me out early on because they would leave foraging walks back in 2006, 2007. And I wasn't hooked right away, but at least I started seeing plants. Up until then, I never saw plants. They never registered in my consciousness at all. It was music. It was sports. It was academics. It was buildings and sidewalks and skateboards and punk rock and all that stuff, but never plants. It wasn't even like in the background. It just wasn't there at all. And they would point out like an amaranth growing from a parking lot meter, like right at the base. And I would think, Oh my gosh, not only is that amaranth, but that's a plant and I'm noticing it for the first time. Also, not only were they huge inspiration for me early on, but I just got so lucky with where I was born, which is in Western Pennsylvania. And we have one of the largest mushroom clubs in the world. Oh, and I wow. jokingly say, but I'm kind of serious when I say it's one of the largest nature organizations in the world because last year we had over 1,000 paid members in this club. That's and Western Pennsylvania isn't that big of an area. I mean, it's not tiny, but it's not huge. But we had over a thousand members last year and we might hit those numbers again this year. The mushroom community is huge here. And I was also fortunate that when I was getting into this hobby or this lifestyle, whatever you want to call it, a lot of mushrooms were popping up at the time. We had a lot of good years. And so you add all those things together. It's like, how could you not get interested in this kind of stuff? I think we all have that innate relationship with natural foods, wild foods, wild mushrooms, that when we start finding them, there's something inside of us that thinks of it as good, if that's the right word. But we think, that's really cool. This is good. I want more of this in my life. And I find that with a lot of people, including myself, if there's a bumper year or a year with a really good harvest and diversity of mushrooms, it's almost impossible not to get hooked. Do you have a story of maybe that first mushroom hunt where you really hit the big time, you know, you really found a ton of mushrooms that you were looking for or a ton of good edibles or, or maybe just one impactful early forage that you had that you remember. I guess it was my first chaga find. 
You know, a lot of people post pictures online of, is this Chaga? And, you know, it's just like, it's an old joke now. You you post a picture of a bike that's in a tree. Is this Chaga? (laughs) Or just some crazy thing in a tree. Is this Chaga? But I have my first, is this Chaga photo on an old flip phone. And I actually just got rid of that flip phone last year only because I had to. They said, we're shutting it off. But no, (laughs) I've had this phone for like 10 years. That's amazing. But one of the first photos on that flip phone was a picture of an oak tree burl which obviously a lot of people confuse for Chaga because I guess to beginner eyes and even from far away, I could still confuse the two as well. Right. I remember taking a picture of my flip phone. Is this Chaga? And I never really showed too many people, but it was just on my flip phone because I thought it might be. And I thought I'll bring it home and show it to my friends. And so I really have empathy for the people who post those pictures. Is this Chaga? And I don't side with the people who make fun of those people (laughs) because I was one of them, you know? And it's like, I understand what it's like to not know some of these things. And I remember finding my first Chaga, which was uh, on my aunt's property. She's got property in Northern Pennsylvania. And I remember going to her place, using that almost as like a campground to then go deeper into the woods up into New York. Because there's Allegheny State Forest, I believe they call it. Allegheny National Forest is in Pennsylvania, but the state forest is up in the New York region. And she said, instead of going up there, which was another hour north, just hang out on my property. Maybe you'll see it. And honestly... I thought the only birch trees were paper birch trees at the time. Just those white peely bark birch trees. I didn't know she had loads of yellow birch, and loads of black birch. I just couldn't identify those things. But she said, just hang out here. And if you don't find it, then go farther north. So I started walking on her property. Sure enough, after about an hour, I found it. And I couldn't believe it. And I was so ecstatic. And I brought it back. And she remembers that story just as much as I do. I mean, she was ecstatic for me to find that. And she felt honored that it was growing on her property. I'll never forget that. That's incredible. And I guess during this journey of transformation for you, did you drag some of your family with you? I mean, are your family now familiar with the natural world, familiarized relative to a layman? Have they gotten hooked as you've gotten deeper and deeper into this? Only a little bit. <laughs> I don't drag <laughs> anybody into this. I realized yeah. a long time ago, it's it's not effective to push this on somebody, to push anything on anybody. I guess yeah. you could provide the inspiration and just lead by example a uh, little bits here and there with some family members but i'm the only one in the family that does such a thing like this even yeah. in my extended family it just came out of left field for all of them of <laughs> course when you get into my friendship circles i've got friends who do this kind of stuff but still i i never push this on anybody and i know it might seem like it or how could you not do this you've got this channel where that's all you talk about and it's really funny because people leave these comments like oh i bet if you get this guy at a party, he'll never shut up about mushrooms or trees or plants. I bet (laughs) I'll just talk all day. Nothing could be further for the truth. I just keep my mouth shut. I don't talk about this stuff. I really don't. And even if people want to geek out about it, I might geek out about it for a minute. And then I'll just turn the conversation back on them because I don't know. I mean, I do this because I feel like I have to. It's not because I want to do it. And I just had this realization a couple weeks ago. It's not like I want to do this stuff. I have to do this stuff. And that's why I do it. But part of that isn't dragging people along with me if they want to come along with me that's perfectly fine but i'm going to keep going that's a really powerful concept the idea that sharing this information about the natural world that's been so important and transformational to you you now have a moral obligation to share that information with other interested people you know it gets to this idea it's kind of an esoteric idea of kind of the great work of spreading higher levels of knowledge and enlightenment becomes mandatory once you reach those levels to then share that with others I'm not calling you enlightened, but I am saying that you have information that other people need to know uh, or that can change people's lives and you feel compelled to share that. That's really, really a powerful, uh, powerful idea. I guess there where you are in Pennsylvania, it seems like you're able to forage year round or at least you're going out and looking year round. I've always been struck by some of your videos where you're talking about things you can still find in the wintertime. Uh, So what are kind of the general foraging seasons there where you are in Pennsylvania and what are you looking for in some of those particular particular seasons? So where I live in Western Pennsylvania, it's classified as a humid continental climate. So we have hot and humid summers, and we have cold winters, generally speaking. Of course, there are some nuances depending if you go farther north or farther east or a little south or a little west. But where I live, which is a little north of Pittsburgh, that's generally what it's like. So we have rainy springs, we have some rainy summers, we have beautiful fall foliage in the autumn months, which is going on right now. And 
in most years, we have very cold winters with some snowfall. And you're right. You can find something all year round. And interestingly, some of my best mushroom hunting has been in the winter. I can find mushrooms sometimes better in the wintertime than I can in the summertime, just depending on the conditions. Because sometimes it'll be warmer in the winter, but it'll be raining. So you'll right. get things like enoki popping up and oyster mushrooms. And you might see some late fall oyster mushrooms or some other things as well. And in the middle of summer, if it's really, really dry and hot, you won't see that much. But some summers are incredible. This year was a little different. It was quite dry, at least mm -hmm. where I live in Western PA. So we didn't have that great of a mushroom season, but it looks like things might turn around. I'm not quite sure. But if not, that's perfectly fine because there's way more out there than just mushrooms. <laughs> I get excited about a lot of other things, but generally speaking, you know, the spring season kind of kicks off the mushroom season for a lot of people because that's when the morels pop up mm -hmm. and they start popping up late March all the way through April into about mid to late May. And then June and July and August, we got the chanterelles, we got the black trumpets, we got the bolete mushrooms, we got the milk cat mushrooms, all different kinds of things popping up. And then usually around mid to late August is when things generally start transitioning over into the autumn mushrooms which is where we are right now so everybody's on the hunt right now for hen of the woods or the maitake mushroom of course everyone's on the hunt for honey mushrooms right now and lion's mane and the harissia mushrooms i really like the autumn mushroom season i mean it's not hard to fill three or four or five or six baskets in a single day sometimes you only have about a two or three week window to do that but it's easy to do that because a lot of the mushrooms that appear in the autumn months are just massive it's not like there's a lot of different kinds. They're just the big ones, like a big hen of the woods or a big chicken mushroom. Right. So it's very easy to fill your basket with those. And then by the time mid-November rolls around, it's generally when things start slowing down, but it doesn't stop completely. And like I said, I mean, if you have rainy, mild winters, which we do get from time to time, you'll start to see mushrooms pop up. And then it starts all over again, back in late March, early April with the morels, and then all the way through summer, fall, and just keeps repeating and repeating and repeating. Yeah. I'm curious. Are When you go foraging, what's your style? Are you kind of a cover the ground, scanning while walking briskly? Are you uh, doing circles in one particular part of the forest, you know, spending one or two hours making sure you've covered every tree and every possible area in a part of a forest? What's the best foraging style for you? Or is it different depending on what you're looking for? Yes, yeah, probably the latter. And honestly, because I film so much and I teach a lot, sure, it's mostly governed by what needs to be taught. So I'll come up with an idea for a video and I'll go to a specific location looking for that thing. And I have blinders on just going for that spot. But maybe along the way, I'm seeing lots of other things. Right. And so I'll forge those kinds of things. Like I recently shot a video on Hen of the Woods, my talking mushroom. But I wasn't going out looking for it. I was looking for a tree because I'm working on this tree project right now. So my day was governed by me looking for a tree that's not that commonly encountered. It's called mountain ash. And it's found in the higher elevations in Pennsylvania. And so I went about an hour and a half away, specifically looking for that tree. But on my way out of the woods, I thought, I'll just look at the bases of oak trees. And sure enough, I found a ton of my taki mushrooms, head of the woods. <laughs> and so lately, I mean, I have this kind of phrase that's, in my mind, it's kind of like a mission, I guess, in my life, which is teach first, eat second. Wow. So I want to teach something first before I actually eat it. Obviously, I've eaten it in the past and I can teach it. But if I find a prime specimen of something, I'm not going to forage it, bring it home and then decide, you know, teach something about it. I want to make sure I get a video out on it before I actually eat that particular specimen. In a lot of my videos, people will say, why don't you ever pick the things that you're talking about? Like you taught us about these morel mushrooms, but you're not picking them. And that's because I need to get B-roll of those mushrooms in the <laughs> ground afterwards. And I didn't think about getting the B-roll first because I got so excited. I thought, I'm just going to roll the camera. But right. I need to keep them in the ground because afterwards I have to get some high quality photographs and I have to get footage of it in the ground. And that's kind of why I leave them there. So that's where teach first, eat second comes into play. But yeah, it just depends. I mean, sometimes I have blinders on and I go to one specific spot for one particular thing, but it's less and less of that lately because I'm looking for all different kinds of things right now. And I feel so grateful that I can go out every single day and look for things. And I like to be a generalist. I just go out to different areas and just see what's out there. Sometimes I'm only looking for wildflowers. 
and I'll, I know I'll find mushrooms when I'm out there, or I know I'll find plants. Sometimes I'm looking for berries, but I know I'll find mushrooms out there as well. Right. It used to be where I would go out for one particular thing, but not as much lately, but I'll still do it. What a powerful mantra to teach first and eat second. I don't know many foragers that can really hold to that. And I think it speaks to how much being an educator and sharing this information with people is central in your practice of doing any kind of land-based practice. I mean, for you, it's about really sharing this with people, not just benefiting yourself or, or kind of harvesting from the natural pantry. You're really trying to go out there, find things and share with others. That was one of my questions I had was how is being an educator of this information changed how you are as a forager? And I think you just spoke directly to that beautifully. For advice for listeners out there, what are a couple mushrooms or maybe even some forage plants that you would recommend as good ones for beginners to start with? Because I get a lot of questions from people about where do I begin? How do I, and, and maybe it's not looking for a specific mushroom. So for any advice for people out there who want to get into mushroom foraging, maybe plant foraging, what are your recommendations to the true neophyte, the true beginner to, to get started? I have two pieces of advice. Number one, spend as much time as you possibly can outside. I'm going to say in the woods because that's where I live. Right. I, I mean, I have woods where I live. I don't live in the woods, but I don't have a desert where I live. I don't have many bogs <laughs> where I live. I don't have the ocean front where I live. But that could be nature to somebody, you know? Clearly, yeah. you're not going to find many mushrooms on the ocean or in the desert. You'll find, I guess, some in the desert areas. But spend as much time as you possibly can in nature. And number two, find the community that will support you in this endeavor. You can't do it alone. I mean, we live in such an interesting time where people think they can do it alone with no matter what they're doing. I think it's crazy that people would consider themselves to be self-taught or ask somebody, are you self-taught? Or even entertain such a notion that you can be self-taught. It's like something is teaching you, something is guiding you. Just admit to it. You're not doing it all by yourself. And you can get into a lot of trouble if you think you could do it by yourself. You'll never go as far as you possibly can unless you incorporate other people. It was the Western Pennsylvania Mushroom Club that really gave me the confidence to go out and to eat something that I picked. I'd never done such a thing before. Food always came in a package to me. Food was always just given to me. I would always buy food or order food or unwrap food. It was never pick something outside. Like I was completely removed from nature. I didn't garden or anything growing up, nothing like that. So it was just such a foreign idea to harvest something from the woods, bring it home and eventually put it inside of my body. And I remember asking some of the mycologists in their club, are you sure this is edible? Are you absolutely sure? They would say, yes, I'm absolutely sure. I've eaten it before. This is what it tastes like. This is what you need to do with it. And that just gave me the confidence early on to just keep going with this. So spend as much time as you can outside and find the community that will support you. And fortunately with mushrooms, there is a huge community. It's a massive community in North America today, bigger than it's ever been before. Yeah, the foraging for plants community is big, but you don't see as many clubs dedicated to foraging for plants. Right. But with mushrooms, you do. And so it is easier. And if there isn't one nearby, just start one. You don't have to be an expert at it. You could just be an expert at gathering people together because there are people who probably live within 20 miles of you who know at least 10 wild mushrooms. And that's probably all you need to get started. Just get the conversation started and then see where it takes you. That is such a good piece of advice. And I think just getting out into nature, even before you think about what you're going to eat, if you think you're interested in this, just getting out in nature and starting to pay attention. And like you put so beautifully, just start looking at one species at a time, go out, find a plant, find a mushroom, try to identify it, do that day in, day out. And before you know it, you're going to have this body of knowledge. And I love what you're saying about educating others, obviously a huge thing in your life. When did you really feel prepared or did you feel prepared when you started sharing this information with other people or did you just have a gift for organizing and communicating you know i still don't feel prepared all the time to teach i really <laughs> don't every yeah. couple of months i wrestle with the question is this right for me should i even be teaching this stuff and i even think about it in the sense that you know in a youtube video people want things short sweet to the point <laughs> two three four minutes five minutes oh you didn't get into the topic after four minutes what's wrong with you and it's like one mushroom could take three hours to teach you, but that doesn't make for a good video and nobody's going to sit through the whole thing. 
Right. And so it's difficult to even like put out these like quick videos on how to identify a species or put eight mushrooms in a video. And I've done these things. I do these kinds of things because I know people watch them. But I realize how difficult it can be to get any kind of information across in such a short amount of time. So honestly, I probably felt more prepared to teach this early on when I didn't know as much. And now <laughs> that I know more, I feel like I'm not as prepared to teach. It's just wow. weird. It's just how I feel. But I keep doing it because I know I have to do it. I feel like if I don't do this, it would literally be like somebody saying, don't breathe or don't eat or don't drink water. And I'd be like, what are you talking about? I have to. That's how I live. It's the same thing with teaching this stuff. I know I have to, even though I don't always feel comfortable doing it, even though it's not always like the thing I want to do when I get up out of bed, I just feel like I have to and something's pulling me along saying, you got to do it or else. And so I'm doing it. Well, I mean, what do you think is at the heart of that though? Because this isn't, obviously it's not about like money for you. It's not, you didn't come from this family lineage of like druids or something where this is something that you have to do. So what is behind that incredible pull to share this information with people? Is it just the transformation you yourself have experienced? Is it because, you know, maybe you think society right now where we are is at this critical juncture where we need to reconnect with nature? What, what, do, you, what do you think is behind that driving force for you? I think about that every day. I don't know. <laughs> It's the mystery. It, it's some, I mean, it's like there were just some things in life that just can't be answered. It's like, yeah. where did you come from? Where are you going? How did we get here? Why are we here? Why am I doing this kind of work? I honestly don't know, but I understand. This is a podcast. People want answers. So I have to kind of like piece together some things that kind of make sense and make it seem like I'm not some crazy lunatic who's just in it for himself. It's just like... <laughs> making up stuff as he goes along. I mean, yeah, I want to see people get outside. I like seeing people interact with nature in a healthy way. I look out and I see there's a lot of depressed people. There's a lot of sad people. There's a lot of sick people. There's a lot of unhealthy people. There's a lot of people looking for hacks. And everybody knows vitamin C is good for you. Everybody knows that Maybe or okay, maybe not everybody knows that organic food might be better for you than conventional food. But I like <laughs> to think that it is healthier. It's becoming more I mean, common. People knowledge. know like the drink eight cups of water a day, get sleep. Like those are kinds of things that will lead to a healthier life. But rarely is a connection to land discussed as something that's absolutely essential for human health. You know, I studied nutrition. I look in the index in the back, go under N, and there's no nature. You don't <laughs> see nature. Nothing. It's just never there. It's food. We talk about food. We talk about nutrients, but it's never tied to nature. But every time you eat, that's another chance to connect to nature because you can have a connection to where that food came from every time you eat. And I just don't think a lot of people realize it. And honestly, I don't realize it fully either. I mean, there's a lot of times where I eat food and I'm not conscious of it. Like I'm thinking about something else. Even when I'm out foraging, sometimes I'm thinking about something else. Right. But I try to just use that as an opportunity to feel super connected to the land that I live on. Land is the greatest nutrient that nobody's discussing. And I think perhaps maybe I realized that a couple of years ago. I don't always think about it, but I think that's one of the things that's driving me. It's just, I feel it in my heart that I have to do something like this. I think if we get out of our heads, we'll do what's right for us. And for me, this is what I have to do. But oftentimes our heads can lead us in pretty precarious situations and directions. But I don't think the heart lies too much, if at all. Well, I mean, we're going to honor the mystery about the core of why you do this. But I think you laid out some very good reasons that seem to fill that gap of understanding of why Adam is so obsessed with sharing information about trees and plants and mushrooms with everybody out there. Those are some very, very compelling reasons. And I love that idea of land as the greatest nutrient. You know, I've often heard this idea that there's different types of food. There's the food you ingest physically. There's the liquids that you ingest, but there's also the ideas, the thoughts, different things that you imbibe into your system. And you may be in a perfect place to expand our milieu of I an idea of diet to include some of these other aspects that might nurture your emotions or might nurture your spirit in a way that just straight physical food maybe can't and often may do the exact opposite when we eat too much of something we know isn't good for us. So that's really, really, really interesting. Do you have any advice for other people who are educators 
you know, other people who do what you do want to share more information because you've been particularly impactful. You've reached a lot of people. You know, do you have any advice for other naturalists or educators? Maybe tips on what they can do that you found to be most effective at communicating or organizing? Any little tidbits like that? You know, we kind of talked about this before we hit the record button, but don't make it about yourself. If you're educating in this stuff, it's not about you. Don't make it about you. The best educators that I know, the best educators that the world knows, understand that it's not about the educator. It's about the subject. It's about what they're teaching. Right. And it's interesting because you see a lot of educators in this community, in the mushroom community, and you don't always get the feeling that they're doing it because they love to teach. You get the feeling that they want to show off what they found. <laughs> or they want to prove that they know more than somebody else, that they're better than somebody else, that they're an expert level that nobody else can get to. Right. You see that with social media anyway. I mean, social media is built for that, to show off the individual, not the community. And I never got into that stuff. I mean, clearly I have social media, but if I could remove my face from it, I would. But I understand that people like to see another human being. They can connect to a human being better than they can connect to a plant or a mushroom. And so I try to be that conduit between the two and connect the two. But if I could remove myself and still have an effective channel, I'd probably do it. But I don't think it would be as beneficial to just hear a voice and just see B-roll all day. I guess people like to see me get excited whenever I talk about this stuff. But yeah, don't make it about yourself. And do it if you absolutely feel like you have to do it and if you love it. If not, don't kid yourself. Maybe it's not for you. I mean, maybe somebody doesn't absolutely love it and they're still trying to teach this kind of thing. Don't kid yourself. Let somebody else take that role. I mean, there's probably something else for you to do. This isn't just for educators in the mushroom community, but just any educator. I mean, I don't know what kind of education you had growing up, but I can probably name only three or four teachers who actually loved what they did. Truth, yeah. Growing up in grade school, in high school, and at the university level. Very, very few. Most people just treated it like a job, paid the bills would satisfy them until they retired. I don't even know what retirement means. <laughs> I don't want to retire. I don't, I mean, retirement, I guess would be death for me because <laughs> this is just an assignment. This is, this is my work. And I encourage other people to do the work that they were meant to do. You know, it's something I've noticed in almost all your videos. There is that element of sharing your passion, your charisma naturally and in earnest, you know, just being yourself, sharing how stoked you are and, maybe for anyone who feels like they want to do this to make sure that it's something really born from deep inside that you do want to share it and make it really about the information you're sharing, not about yourself or, or try to as best you can. I'm sure there's a balance there. Like you said, you have to have enough personality where people can connect with it, but make it as much about the natural subject as possible. Definitely something I'm always struck by with your videos. And we've talked a lot about education, your push to educate. So it's pretty obvious the drivers there but what really led to the formation of learn your land as a platform at this point it's huge it's hundreds of thousands of people on youtube and all over social media but what led you to think okay i'm going to start making videos and really putting out this content because clearly it's like an extra responsibility to take on when you're out communing with the natural world and foraging, you suddenly have to think about how am I going to frame this? How am I going to present this? So what really started that ball rolling for you? So I created Learn Your Land in 2014 because I wanted to learn the land that I live on. Okay. And so it sense. was basically just my mission in life. I'm just going to call it. That's going to be my project. It's going to be my organization, Learn Your Land. And like you said in the introduction, it was mostly a way for people who wanted to learn skills in nature, like plant foraging or mushroom foraging or tree identification, for those interested people to connect with naturalists and educators. So for a long time, I had a database on the Learn Your Land website where you could go there and find educators, mostly in Pennsylvania. It's a very local specific website that hosted environmental centers, state parks and nature organizations. And just connecting the two groups of people, educators and people who want to learn from them. Because that's what I wanted to do. <laughs> I felt, oh, this is such an easy way to learn. There's so many state parks who offer these free classes or very inexpensive classes or these environmental centers that have like bird walks and all these different things. And if you just attend these once a week, you could learn so much information. So I decided to create that 
And at the time, early on, I was interviewing other naturalists. If you scroll back far enough on my YouTube channel, you'll see me interviewing other naturalists and having them stand in the spotlight and teach about different things. Right. And every now and then I would do a standalone video. And I saw that my videos were getting more views than the other videos, the interview videos. And people were commenting more. And I thought, I'll just slowly start doing more of these videos. And eventually got to the point where I just started doing almost all the videos myself. I guess every now and then I'll interview somebody, but it's mostly me talking about a plant or a mushroom or a tree. So that's what Learn Your Land has become. But honestly, as far as videos and why I decided to do video content, a couple reasons. I mean, I grew up shooting a lot of video. My dad is a photographer. He gave us a camera. We would shoot all kinds of crazy videos growing up, like skit videos and comedy videos and skateboarding and music videos. So I was very good with the camera and to a very small degree, the editing process. I was at least familiar with it. And in 2014, 2015, blogs were kind of like being supplanted by video content and image content. And so I was blogging too, but not many people were reading things that I was writing. And I realized that people were just watching the videos. And honestly, I like doing videos now because it's harder to do. It's so easy to take a picture of a mushroom and post it on Instagram or Facebook and say, look what I found. It's so much harder to shoot a video on it. And I like that discipline. Like, I like that hard work. It's stressful sometimes. I don't always want to do it. It'd be so much easier to just post a picture of a chicken of the woods that I found. It's a lot harder to spend a whole week researching that thing and coming up with some kind of story that somebody would want to sit through for 10 minutes. I learn a lot by doing that. I learn so much more by shooting a video than I do by creating some kind of written content on Facebook or Instagram or in a blog because I'm spending a lot of time with that organism. I'm photographing it. I'm videotaping it. So right there, there's like an hour, an hour and a half of me just sitting there with that thing, observing it, moving it around, holding it, shooting it at different angles. And I'm just picking up so much information and then bringing that home and either eating it or studying it some more, maybe under a microscope, but researching it. And then the editing process you listen to it over and over and over again. At least I do. I mean, I check these videos 10, 15, 20 times before I release them, just making sure I don't make any mistakes. Right. And you just, it's basically like listening to an audiobook on chicken of the woods or an Amanita mushroom <laughs> or a Haricia mushroom. And you're, it's just reiterating. It's you speaking. I mean, you're just right. speaking to yourself, basically. You're just listening to it over and over and over again so that when you go out, without a smartphone or without a book and somebody says, what is that mushroom? And they want to know about it. Uh, you could speak for half an hour, an hour on it if you wanted to. I don't do that, but you have that kind of information. So the video content is basically like me getting a PhD in every single mushroom or plant or tree that I learned because I'm putting in a lot of time doing it. You know, I have to agree when you listen to something a second time for any interview that I've ever done, when I listen to it again, I actually get so much more out of it than when I'm doing it the first time around. So that makes a lot of sense. It's still part of your learning process. I mean, you're helping share with others. There's a craft to it, almost an art to it, to make an effective, compelling video. But then it also is part of your education process. And it gets back to that adage that I love, which is a lot of times we teach what we need to or want to learn. So that all makes a lot of sense. Have you gotten any feedback from people over the years? I'm sure you've gotten feedback from people. But is there any particularly... Uh, potent feedback or stories that you've gotten from people about how you've influenced them or changed their own relationship with the natural world or anything like that that's really kind of been this like amazing affirmation of, wow, the work I'm doing is really changing and, and sharing what I want to share with people. Yeah, I mean, I get emails a lot in comments about somebody watching my video then going out and finding something. And it's always neat when they think I'm reading their minds <laughs> where they want to learn something and all of a sudden, I put a video out on it. But I think it's just because, you know, things are in season. So they're thinking about something. And so right. I just happen to put a video out on that. I mean, there's nothing really in particular that stands out. But it's interesting. You know, I don't talk a lot about medicinal mushrooms because I realize how controversial of a topic it can be these days. But I've gotten countless emails over the years saying, thank you so much for teaching me about this particular medicinal mushroom. I had X condition for years, even decades, and I don't have it anymore. And the only thing that person changed was they added a particular mushroom into their diet. And it's not like it's going to happen to everybody. And it's not like you can prove that such a thing will happen to another person who would 
have the same exact conditions, same exact circumstances. Right. But it happened for that person. And how can you argue with that experience? You know, people always say, it's not enough research on this stuff. It's like, yeah, there will never be enough research. Like, that's <laughs> the game that these people play. If it's a natural medicine, there's never going to be enough research. That's just sure. the way they want it. But if you have personal experience with something, I know like we're stepping outside of the realm of science, but to somebody who doesn't have lupus or multiple sclerosis anymore, and they did for 15 years, what are you going to say? Stop taking that mushroom because there's not enough research, even though it healed you, even though it fixed you, stop taking it because there's no science on it. It's crazy to me, but I get emails like that from time to time, but I don't push it on anybody, this kind of stuff. I just say, look into it because you never know. And what they did for me is these mushrooms, the medicinal mushrooms, keep me tethered to the forest because they were the first ones that got me out looking for mushrooms, even edible mushrooms and looking for poisonous mushrooms and all different kinds of mushrooms just for study. Yeah. But whenever I drive around, I mean, I'm looking at the trees. I'm looking for conks. I'm looking for things just pointing out of sticking out of a tree, seeing if it might be a mushroom. And no matter how much I want to, you know, maybe work inside for a day to just edit something or not like I want to take a break from spending time in nature, but there's obligations, you know, the mushrooms keep pulling me back into the woods. So they keep me tethered to the forest and I owe the medicinal mushrooms for that. And if nothing else, it's like they're medicinal in the sense that they help me find my passion. Wow. And what could be more medicinal than that? It's like, you can give me all the medicine you want, but if I don't know my passion, why would I want to live? There's more sides of us to nurture than just the physical body or the physical vessel. There's many more things that need nutrition. And this is interesting coming from someone who is a nutritionist, someone who studied dietetics. I guess, how much do wild foods, now I'm imagining it's like this centerpiece of your diet, you've got your medicine cabinet stocked from the forest, but how much does wild food and wild medicine uh, really feature in your life and in your diet on all these different levels? In my mental diet, about 98%. Sure. <laughs> meaning I'm thinking about it a lot. As far as, my, I mean, I've never calculated like calorie wise and percentage wise. Honestly, it's not that much because I feel like I need to teach more than eat these kinds of things. It's just a lot of time involved to film these things, to research them, to edit. I wish I could go out and harvest hickory nuts all day and black walnuts all day and hunt deer all day if I could, because I could really stock up my pantry and fill my freezers with this stuff. And I do to some degree, but it's not anywhere near where I would like it to be. And I also realized that you could never do it alone. Again, you would need a community to support you in this. If you want to live off of wild foods 100%, good luck trying to do it contently by yourself, even with one other person. You can do it. I know people have tried it as an experiment, but I don't know anybody who's done it longer than two years or even one year. And they always look forward to going back to the domesticated foods because it's a lot of work. But let's say you have 15 people helping you out, 30 people and 40 people and 50 people, then you could easily get something like this done. But as far as water, nearly 100% of my water is wild water, meaning I go out and I forage wild spring. Wow. Yeah. So that was a discipline that I implemented 10 years ago, and I've never wavered from it. I mean, it is at the centerpiece of my hydration strategy. I don't talk about this a lot. I don't know why I don't. I mean, I tend to focus on foods more than water, but 100% of water is spring water, unless it's like I'm somewhere else where I have no access to fresh water and I'm really, really thirsty. Of course, I'll make some sacrifices, but if I can choose, it's going to be spring water. Medicine, nearly 100% of it is wild foraged. It's a lot of mushrooms, a lot of plant tinctures. And as far as calorically dense foods, I don't know the percentage, but it's not insignificant, but it's not significant either. But every day I'm eating something, either nibbling on it out in the wild or making a significant meal out of it at home because I did forage or harvest a lot of it. It's there and it grows every year. I mean, it gets stronger and stronger. Yeah. And in terms of feeding you on kind of a spiritual level, and I go there with a lot of guests because that's what commuting with the land has done for me. You know, how has this incredible connection you've developed with the land right around you there in Western Pennsylvania. How is that integrated into spiritual practice for you? I think that can look different for everyone, whether it's, you know, foraging is the act of meditation, or whether it's enhanced other practices like meditation or yoga, where you need some kind of alert stillness. But how has this connection with the land become part of your spiritual practice, if it has? And you might tell me, No, I'm not really woo-woo. It's not really spiritual for me. 
So I don't know how you would categorize what I'm about to say. Maybe some people would consider it spiritual. Maybe some people would consider it to be material. And not like the two are always separated, but it's made me feel like I belong to a place. Like I'm not homeless. Clearly, I have a home. I'm talking to you through this incredible technology, sitting in a nice warm home right now. But beyond that, feeling like I belong to a particular piece of land. And I think it's interesting, you know, a lot of people, even though they wouldn't admit it, even though they have homes, feel homeless. Mm. They don't know where they belong. And it's so easy for people to hop around the world because things have been so globalized that you can go from one end of the country to the other and things don't look that different. There's still a shopping mall. <laughs> There's still right. a Walmart. There's still roads. You can find many of the same trees because they just plant them. Ever. People just plant them in locations that look like Europe <laughs> because yeah. that's where most of our plants come from anyway. Right. Right. And so if you have that kind of reality where no matter where you go, things kind of look relatively similar, you're going to feel like you can belong to everywhere. And that's a problem because human beings have always felt like they belong to a particular place and they've always loved living in a particular place. Don't get me wrong. I like to travel. I like to move around, but I like to feel rooted. I like to feel like um, I'm grounded to a particular place and eating wild foods and foraging helps me feel completely, I don't even know the exact words, but it's almost like my feet are firmly planted here. And that's why I love talking about Western Pennsylvania so much. I mean, in my videos, I talk about Western Pennsylvania a lot. And a lot of people want me to travel to different places and do videos all over. And maybe one day I will. Right. But I just love this area so much. It is only, that love only strengthens when I eat more of this food and I drink more of this water and I learn more about it. Mm. And for people who do feel that sense of homelessness, I would just say, learn your land. Like literally learn it because learning is the beginning of appreciation, which is the beginning of admiration, which is the beginning of love, which leads to connection and leads to a sense of purpose. And I felt all of that just by foraging for wild foods here in Pennsylvania. So I don't know if that's spiritual or not, but that's what it's done for me more than just provide calories or help me meet new <laughs> friends or yeah. give me a paycheck or give me a sense of purpose. I mean, I feel rooted here and it feels really good. Yeah, I think a lot of us are missing that intimate connection, you know, where we don't feel like we belong to a particular place. And land is so central to the human experience that what you're saying makes so much intuitive sense. Like, of course, when you connect with the land in such an intimate way, all of these different faculties and drives are going to be fulfilled because that's kind of what we're built for. We're built to develop and nurture a relationship with the land that gives us life and surrounds us. How much do you think that this knowledge of natural places, developing connection to land, is that a big part of moving toward kind of the more utopian future that I think a lot of us want. You know, I think we all get a lot of movies and a lot of programming about dystopian future. And when politics shift around, we all get really scared about what the future is going to look like. But does this sense of groundedness and this relationship that we can develop individually and on a local level with land around us, does that become part of a, a solution or part of a, a movement toward a better future? I think it's absolutely essential as things move into a dystopian future. Mm. That's just how I see it. I mean, I like to think I'm an optimist. A lot of people think I'm an optimist. I don't classify myself as, as an optimist or a pessimist, but I take a look around. I mean, I guess I do have hope. I see the good things happening, but I see a lot of bad things happening as well. And it looks like things would get bad before they actually get better. I honestly don't know how humans could come out of what's about to happen without going through something extremely catastrophic. But I do think that the people who have found a connection to land will come out with less struggle, not challenges. There's no such thing as no challenges. And nobody would want a world without challenges because we would all just be so weak. Like challenges make us stronger, but right. it doesn't have to be extreme struggle. It could be a challenge without a lot of struggle. And I think the people who do have some sense of connection to land will experience less struggle moving forward. And that doesn't necessarily have to mean 
you know, land ownership in my mind, because I agree so much with what you're saying. I think that can just be a relationship with the land around you. And one part of this, because I also see it as a key part to helping humanity navigate the cumulative, let's say, cultural karma we've collected that are going to lead to some challenges in the future. You know, I think a connection to land is definitely a, and getting ownership again over our local land and ownership in the sense of familiarity with it and our, our mastery of working with that land is such a big part to navigating those challenges. So where does this concept of land trusts come in? What are land trusts and how do they feature in this concept of enhancing this relationship with land? So a land trust is a way for people to finally give back because human beings are on the take. We take, we take, we take, we take, we take, we <laughs> use, we use, we use, we exploit, we exploit, we exploit, we right. abuse, we abuse ad infinitum. But what do we give back? Hardly anything. I mean, I harvest so much from wild spaces. Yeah. And the amount that I give back is so small compared to what I take. And I don't feel good about that. And so I'm constantly trying to have this conversation with myself and with other people who are willing to listen about, you know, as foragers who take, what can we give back? And I understand yeah. that, yeah, you're harvesting mushrooms. We well, are helping it to sporulate in the woods. You're actually making for more mushrooms. I get that. I understand. But still, why didn't you pick up that trash when you were out there? You saw it. Why did you walk right past it? Why did you not donate money to the volunteers who are taking care of those trails? Why did you just run home and post a picture of yourself smiling next to this big hall? And then on to the next picture, on to the next picture, on to oh, the that next one. picture. That one hit close to home. <laughs> it hits close to home for all of us because right. we're all guilty of it because it's extremely ego gratifying to do this kind of stuff. Because, I mean, it's competitive and I understand. It's not like it never wasn't competitive to hunt the bigger deer or the bigger elk or find the bigger mushroom or more plants or the bigger honey hole, all those kinds of things. Like, I get it, but there has to be some kind of reciprocity involved. And it could take the form of all different kinds of things. It could be, like I said, picking up trash. It could be planting native plants somewhere or turning your yard into a native plant garden, essentially. But one easy way for people to do is through money because yeah. money talks. And <laughs> you could do a lot of good with money. You could do a lot of bad with money. You could do all kinds of things with money. But one thing you can do is help to protect land from being developed. And land trusts are organizations that can help you do that. They can take your money after you give it to them, of course. I mean, it's completely voluntary, but they'll oversee a particular piece of property and make sure that it stays in good hands for a very, very long time. I would say forever, but who knows what forever actually is. I mean, I don't know if that's a legal term or not, but right. you can donate money to a land trust. They can take care of a piece of property. Or they can take care of what are called conservation easements, I believe, which is you could donate not necessarily your entire land to a land trust, but you can basically have legal agreements over what that kind of land, what things can be done to it or not done to it moving right. forward. So even right. if you die, the next owners still can't develop it, even though those owners own it. There's a conservation easement, there's an agreement with a land trust that says, well, actually, you cannot put any more structures in there, or you cannot put a road through there, or you cannot turn that particular piece of land into a housing development. You can own it, but you can't do that because we have an agreement with the previous owner. Yeah. But there are lots of land trusts out there that work on conservation of land, of wetlands, of mountains, of valleys, of plains, of plateaus, all different kinds of areas. And they basically give a voice to wildlife first and humans next or third or fourth or fifth. And most people who talk about land, you know, with real estate deals, it's all about the people. It's all right. about people. never factor in wildlife, never factor in animals, never factor in plants, never factor in mushrooms, never factor in anything else except human beings. And for once, with the land trust agreement, the land speaks first. And it's so easy to do so. I mean, you make some money, donate to a land trust at the end of the year. <laughs> You can write it off in your taxes if you have a good CPA. And there's a lot of land trusts out there. And um, I strongly support people doing that with their money. It's not the only thing that you could do, but it's an important thing that somebody can do. And I mean, even going further than that, maybe somebody listening right now will take this to the extreme and work as hard as they possibly can, acquire a lot of land, and then put it in their will that a land trust will take it after they pass away. 
And so it will be prevented from being developed forever, essentially. And I know that's a huge task. Like, why would somebody do that? Or can everybody do that? But maybe somebody would do that. There's a lot of things you can do. Well, you just laid out an argument for why this is, you know, developing a relationship with land is so important to the future of our societies. It's important that we then save pieces of land to actually develop a relationship with. Uh, and that's what I was struck by is the concept of a land trust seems like a great vehicle to maintain natural spaces for us to then go and commune with and help to develop that sense of place. And e even if we don't own land ourselves, I'm sure like me, a lot of listeners don't actually own quote unquote land or, or property. And, you know, we need to find places where we do have access. And we're, I'm lucky enough to be in California where we have a robust, you know, state park system and actually they're okay with you harvesting mushrooms, but, it's not like that everywhere. And it just seems like such a great way to pay it forward, preserve parts of nature for us to, I don't want to make it too much about humans, but for us to then be able to go back to and, and continue to, to develop those relationships. You know, I'd be totally remiss. I skipped this question and we've gotten into like really big conceptual talk, which I love because I see the work you're doing and what you're trying to inculcate in people as such a big part of kind of moving the needle back to helping humans achieve homeostasis with the planet. But I'd be remiss if I didn't ask you about your basics of mushroom identification, because this is the mushroom hour and you do so many videos identifying mushrooms. So for me and those of us out there who are mushroom foragers, when you find a mushroom in the wild, you know, what are some, and maybe even before that, how are you picking out where you're gonna look and then what are you looking at when you actually find a mushroom that's going to help you figure out how to start identifying it? There's a lot of questions there, uh, but a lot of good questions as well. Like I said before, honestly, when I'm going out looking for mushrooms now, it's usually uh, a result of me probably looking for something else. And then I come across right. a lot of mushrooms because there's a lot of things out here in Pennsylvania that I just get so excited about. But when you're looking for mushrooms, I mean, a lot of people just want to find the edible mushrooms. And I would encourage you, just learn them all as they come along. Each one is going to present itself to you at a certain point in your life. And you don't know if that's by design or not, but let's just pretend it is by design. Okay. And if you don't learn that one right then, you might never learn it again. Because as you know about mushrooms, these things are so ephemeral, they're so mysterious. You might see it once and never, ever see it again, even in the same spot, even if the conditions seem ideal. It could yeah. be a decade before you see the same species ever again. And so try to learn them as they come along. And I encourage people to take photos of things. And I know a lot of people do that today because they've got the devices to do it. But I really learn things when I spend more time with them. And it isn't just a photo. That's why I like taking video. But I understand a lot of people aren't going to go that far. But as much time as you can spend with each mushroom, the better you're going to be able to get a, a good identification of that particular species. So spend lots of time with it. I don't use too many field guides these days. I mean, I understand that field guides have their place and there are a lot of good ones out there, but it seems like with online identification with Facebook groups and iNaturalist and Mushroom Observer, there's just big communities out there that will support you and give you almost an immediate ID. Right. But I do encourage people to try to figure it out themselves first, because by doing that, even if you spend two days looking at all these different mushrooms online or in a book and you can't come up with the answer, you are learning other species at the same time because you're comparing and contrasting things. You're picking up on the jargon and the language that they're using. Like, what's a site? A stipe? What's a basidia? What's a spore? If I don't even know what a spore is, or what's a micron, or what's a cap? What's a pileus? What are all these things? What's lamellae? So you might look those things up. But if you just post a picture of something online and you get an immediate ID, you're not getting any of that information whatsoever. And it's right. on to the next species. And it's on to the next species. I've been able to learn a lot of this stuff because I try my very best to learn and then bring it to the community afterwards. Right. And honestly, I think that's what any good educator would do. They would make the student try first before giving them the answer. And then as the last resort, the educator says yes or no, or let me help you further with that identification. But just learn it one species at a, at a time. And also understand that foraging for mushrooms and being a good mushroom hunter takes a lot of time. It's a skill just like any other. If you want to learn piano, 
you are not going to learn it in a year. Trust <laughs> me. You're not even going to be good four years from now. In 10 years, you're going to be pretty good. But in 20 years, you're going to look at yourself 10 years ago and think, I was so bad. Right, it's the same right. thing with mushrooms. Just treat it like a skill that you can try to master, but I hate to say it, you're never going to master it because there's no such thing as mastery in nature. No such thing because there's always a level deeper, always mm. a level deeper, even the deepest level, it can only go deeper than that. And so approach it with humility, but understand that it's going to take a very, very long time. But the more time you put into it, the faster you will be able to acquire this information. And if you constantly come back to a purpose, like, why am I doing this? Why is this important to me? You're going to learn it so much faster. If you don't have a why, if you don't have a meaning behind it or a reason, you'll learn things, but it's not going to stick. You won't be able to recall things for too long. But if you have a why, it'll stick and it'll actually mean something to you and to those people that you teach. And to pay it forward, teach this stuff, but teach it with humility. Don't be aggressive about it. Don't be an expert ostensible expert where you just act like an expert to everybody but be gentle about it and if people come along and say i want to learn this be attentive to that and be really receptive and be willing to share that information because when you do share this information you're also learning a lot in the process because if you learn to teach this stuff that only solidifies it even more i mean if you read a book it's fine but if you read a book knowing that you've got to get a presentation out of it at the end of it or write a thesis or teach this to 30 people or have somebody film you in front of a stage presenting on a particular topic, then you're really going to learn this. You're going to synthesize it better than if you never taught it at all. So maybe imagine, you know, consult your field guide, share with the community, and then maybe imagine you're going to have to give a speech on this in front of a mycological society, and then you'll be really driven to learn the ins and outs of whatever you just found. Now, I love I love that. And I think the purpose that most people latch onto, which is, like we said at the beginning, one of the most powerful ones, is this something that I can eat? I want to start foraging these gourmet mushrooms. And that can be a super powerful impetus to actually drive you forward and, and be enough to make it stick and make that information really stick in your mind. I guess with your learn your land, I know right now the future is in flux for a lot of people, but you just hinted at a cool tree project you got going on. What, what's in the future for you? What projects do you have uh, right now in the queue that you're working on? Yeah, so I'm working on a pretty extensive tree project. I'm filming and photographing and researching trees in Eastern North America and wow. putting it all together into something that I will release in probably a year and a half at the earliest. Maybe a little later than that. We'll see how it goes. But I love it because it's helping me focus on something else that's not on the ground and that's not a mushroom. And I understand (laughs) that like I'm a mushroom guy to a lot of people and I still love mushrooms and I love foraging them, but there's way more to life and more to nature than just mushrooms. And you only become a better mushroom hunter by learning everything else that's out there, everything that you possibly can. I mean, how essential is tree identification to mushroom foraging? It's absolutely essential. I mean, a lot of these mushroom species form connections with trees. And if you know what the trees are and you know where they are, nothing's stopping you from finding that particular mushroom. I guess certain environmental conditions might stop you, but it's so essential to foraging for mushrooms. But beyond that, I mean, just trees are so ubiquitous. They're so common. There's not as many of them compared to mushrooms. So they're kind of easier to learn. Right. For some reason, a lot of people just overlook them and say, oh, I need to learn that. I'll get to it one day. And so I'm just spending a year or two learning these trees and filming them and photographing them and compiling them into a project and then releasing that in a couple of years. I've gotten into so many new locations. I found so many new mushrooms by doing this. I've been photographing birds doing it. It's just been an absolute delight to work on this. Hard. I mean, it's the hardest thing I've ever worked on in my life. Wow. But there is no prize at the end without extensive labor. I mean, ask any childbearing woman that... (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> they'll give you that answer the prize comes after painstaking labor uh is it just kind of the survey of the biodiversity for you is it just learning what trees are out there and maybe i don't want you to give away the whole project but is there kind of a a takeaway that you are going to want people to have from the work yeah learn your trees they've okay. got messages for you as well i mean people yeah. tend to think oh the mushrooms have the messages for me i'll just go for the mushrooms or these certain plants they have the messages for me right but a tree does as well yeah. trees are incredible beings they really are and i think as big as they are 
and as massive as they can be, they're still underappreciated and overlooked by the general naturalist community because they are so common. Mm-hmm. I mean, it, it's so much sexier to find a rare wild orchid in a bog somewhere or even a common orchid, but just orchid in the name. It's like, yeah, like I'm going to post that. I'm going to get a thousand likes. In that. <laughs> but you post a tree and it's like crickets, you know? Yeah. But I mean, if you just follow the trees, there's magic in that journey. There really is. And talking with a lot of naturalists, it is sometimes the most common or the most overlooked things because they're ubiquitous in our environment that actually we still have the most to learn about because mm-hmm. people often get interested in something rare and we don't really flesh out the picture of these really common organisms that are so important. And uh, yeah, I think anyone who gets into mushrooms and mycology, you naturally start expanding that lens when you realize, I mean, nowadays with the technology we have, the knowledge base we have, it's hard to get away from the fact that all these organisms are inexorably connected and you need to start learning about all of them. So I think that's a terrific project to have in the works for you is an examination of trees. And where can people find you? Where can people find the channel? I guess it's not about you, So, but where can people find the Learn Your Land channel? Where are the best ways people can learn more about your work? YouTube is probably where I put the most work out. Uh, so youtube.com slash learn your land. But if you just search learn your land anywhere using any search engine, you'll find stuff. I've got a website and uh, I got an email newsletter as well. So I send out content a couple times a month, maybe twice. And it's all very intentional. It's never just like, here's what I'm thinking today. Here's what I ate for breakfast. Just wanted to reach out and say hi. Right. I mean, it's like, oh, it's an intentional thing that I worked on that I'm really excited to share with people. But yeah, learn your land. That's pretty much the only name that I go under these days besides my own. And I think you go by that name more than your own. If the internet is any indication, I find learn your land more than than Adam Harriton. I want to ask you the, I call these the mushroom hour big three that I ask all my guests. And the first one I love because I get so many great answers. But what is a mushroom that you love or really appreciate and why? And this doesn't have to be a favorite. It could be anything, but just a mushroom you love and you want to share with us and why. So it's usually the one that I most recently learned or filmed or spent a lot of time with. And I'd have to say the freckled dapperling, which is a mushroom that I recently filmed. And so it's on YouTube. I learned this one years ago, the freckled dapperling. It's a Lepiota-like mushroom, but it's in a new genus, which is Echinoderma. So it's Echinoderma asperum, A-S-P-E-R-U-M. It's a very common mushroom and it's ubiquitous. It's found in Europe and North Africa and Asia and North America. And it fruits in the fall here in Eastern North America. And I was actually out two weeks ago filming trees. And I thought I'd check some oak trees for Hand of the Woods or Maitake. And I found a little one and I decided to leave it because it was small. And I thought, you know, if I come back, it'll be bigger. Or somebody else would just forge it. And that's perfectly fine. Either case, I'm I'm perfectly okay with that. And so I left it. And then no sooner did I leave that than I found another tree full of these freckled dapperling mushrooms. I thought nobody's going to touch these because they don't even look edible. They kind of look poisonous. And I thought they were poisonous. I always remember people telling me they were poisonous. And I thought, I'm going to film a video on freckled dapperlings and how people don't talk about how poisonous these mushrooms are. And so I went home and started flipping through my field guides and One field guy says it's edible. Another one says edible with caution. Another one says that it's said to be edible. Another one says it's inedible. And then online, every website says it's poisonous. I'm like, what's going on here? I thought this thing was poisonous. (laughs) So I did more research on it. And it turns out that not many people eat this mushroom. I don't think it's been responsible for any deaths, but it has been associated with alcohol-induced poisonings. Kind of Mm -hmm. like ink caps that don't go well with alcohol. Right. There's some mechanism with this mushroom, and it's not coprine, which is that compound that's found in cat mushrooms. It's an unknown mechanism in the freckle dapperling that has been associated with alcohol-induced poisonings. And so I researched this. I did about eight hours of research and condensed this down into like a 10-minute video and put it on YouTube. But because I spent so much time with it, I just had a really strong appreciation for it over the past couple of weeks and i understand that it'll pass and then i'll be on to the next mushroom the next one but you asked and that's the one at the top (laughs) of the list for me right now that's the beauty of that i love hearing 
mushrooms people are into. Maybe I should start asking, you know, what's the mushroom of the moment for you? Because that's really what I want is what people are into right now. So that's, that's perfect. Uh, and then kind of a big broad question, but what has a relationship with mushrooms and a relationship with kingdom fungi, 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 uh, given to you? You know, what has that brought to your life? How does that change perspectives or, or deepened your relationship with the natural world? So two things, and I guess I kind of mentioned them earlier, but I'll mention yeah. them again. Number one, they keep me tethered to the forest more so than most other things. I know I keep talking about trees, but early on it was the <laughs> mushrooms. Like that's what actually, it was like the gateway organism to nature. Right. I wouldn't have found my way back into there. I don't think the plants had that strong of a pull for me early on, at least. Now it's all pretty much equal, but they kept me tethered. It's like I could walk away for a little bit, but boom, I'd be snapped back. Go away for a little bit, boom, be snapped back. Like. I'd be skipping obligations, like bailing on friends because I have to get into nature. Like the mushrooms are calling. Right. So I got to get out there. So they just kept me tethered there and they still do to this day. But they've also given me an assignment. And that's how I kind of look at this work. And as I mentioned before, this is work that I feel like I have to do. And I feel like it's an assignment. I don't know who gave it to me. I don't know why I've been given this assignment. I don't know when it's going to end but I treat it like any assignment that I've been given in school. I'm going to work hard at it and I'm going to try to pass and I'm just going to keep doing it. Like I'm going to set aside other things. I'm going to sacrifice a lot of my life to just complete this assignment. And who knows, maybe in five years it'll be done. I have no idea. And if I'm feeling called to do something else, like teach people about cars or football or I don't know what else it is, anything. Heavy metal. Heavy metal. Yeah. Maybe that would be more realistic. I would honor that feeling inside of me, but the feeling now that force is pulling me out here to do this assignment. And the mushrooms were basically the first organisms to tell me that that is going to be your work. Wow. So it may have been some rogue mushroom mycelium that overtook Adam's body, or maybe some tree roots that got in there. But you have that thing that I think all of us hope to find. And I have a little bit of that. And that's why I want to put the mushroom hour out. But it's that driving force of like, I don't know why I just need to do this. It's that core of purpose. And yeah, it's it's something that once you find yourself driven like that, you just have to pursue it and see where it leads. And I think you definitely have are taking that all the way. And I'm excited to see to see where this leads for you. And then what is the lasting impact that you hope to make with your work? We've nibbled around the edges of it, the whole talk that we've had here. But what's the lasting impact you hope to make uh, in teaching people about the land? You know, it's such a good question. And it's not a question that motivates me. I never think about it. I never think about my hope for this work or what I hope that it will do or how it could inspire people. Like I understand that it does those kinds of things. Sure. But it's not something that I focus on. Like I said, it's just work that I have to do. And any influence and motivation that I provide, I guess is secondary to just putting my head down and getting this stuff done. I mean, I understand that all the standard answers are like, yeah, of course you would want to get people outside. And you'd want people to be inspired to learn plants and mushrooms and trees and donate to land trust and all that. And who wouldn't want that? Like I want that as well. But as far as lasting, I'm not even convinced that anything is lasting. Hmm. And I feel like I'd be setting myself up for disappointment if I thought that I would have any lasting impact because even <laughs> stone has a shelf life. Everything has a shelf life, including yeah. my work in 200 years. People will probably remember four people that lived today. I mean, how yeah. many people can you really name that lived a thousand years ago, two thousand years ago, five thousand years ago? Hardly any at all. And I've just accepted that, that I've got work to do now. I understand that it will definitely have rippling effects for the future. And I hope that they will be positive. But I also understand the other side of impact, which is the negative side of impact. My impact on this earth has been huge. And I don't mean that in the sense that, oh, look at the videos that I put out. Look at the Instagram following that I have. I mean, how many trees have been logged for my existence? How much trash has wow. accumulated because I've been alive? And what have I done to mitigate that? And I can honestly say not that much, but I'm trying. And so I think what impact I want to have is actually a pretty small one. I'm trying to reduce my impact. 
unsurprisingly, that's the answer I get from many naturalists. It's like, well, it's not really about the impact. It's actually about kind of moving the needle. So we all have less of an impact, really. But Adam, thank you so much for coming on the show and just sharing more about who you are. I was deeply curious because you're someone who I've watched your videos four or five years ago when I was just getting into foraging. You know, the big Adam smiling on the YouTube videos, what we were watching to get us really stoked and get us out into nature. So it's just a, a pleasure to meet you, learn more about you, learn about your ethos, learn from you. And I'm just excited to to keep following your work and encourage everyone to do the same. So thank you for coming on the Mushroom Hour. Yeah, thanks, Darren. Keep up the great work yourself. Thank you.